بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى عليه وصحبه وسلم أما بعد أحبت في الله we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us all with ikhlas with the battle of sunnah and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us of our many sins and help us to be better slaves of his tabarak wa ta'ala. And bless us to benefit from the afdal ayyam, from the best days which are steadily approaching. And these are excellent days for ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fast to pray, to make dua, to give sadaqah, to do all kinds of khair. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in khair. A question was asked about the statement, every sect springs from the khawarij. And the question was as, as follows. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I recently came across a statement. I think it was the book, Kun Salafin ala Jadda. Or it might have been Ibn uh, bin Imam Muzni's Shara Sunnah, Wallahu A'lam, that every deviant sect springs from or branches off from the Khawarij. And I was wondering if you could explain what this means so I can understand it a little better. Bi'idnillah. Jazakallah khairan. Wa iyyakum. First and foremost, Ahabatu fillah. May Allah tabaraka ta'ala bless us all with ilm al nafiya wa riskan tayyibu wa amilam al So, before getting into this specific text, and again, we need to see about the text itself, I wanted to mention basically four things that are of import for us. First, when we talk about athar of the Salaf, narrations of the Salaf, if this is a narration of, of the Salaf, the first thing we need to look at is uh, thabut, meaning is this an authentic text or not? Is this a narration? It's authentic. It was in one of the books of Creed. Uh, as an ethar, it, was it um, authentic or not? So that's something very, very important. <coughs> First and foremost is, is knowing about the authenticity of the statement. Is it a sound statement or not attributed to one of the Salaf or not? So that's something very important. And that even, of course, with a hadith, as we know the science of uh, Mustala Hadith and Jarwa Ta'deel and all those sciences related to Hadith authentication, that they are uh, very important. It's a very important science. The second point I want to mention is then looking at the meaning of the text. Okay, it, or perhaps it's a text that may have some weakness and maybe it's not authentic, but its meaning could be sound. The meaning of the text itself could be sound. So, as we'll have some text, uh, they could be a hadith, or they could be narrations of the Salaf, and perhaps they could be uh, proven to be weak or not authentic by the scholars of hadith. And so, with that being the case, then perhaps the meaning of the text is has muafaqa, with the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So that would be another thing uh, to look at. So perhaps something is a, a statement and it could have, be sound in its meaning, but it's not a, an authentic statement. It's not a hadith that a Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and maybe it's not an authentic athar from one of the salaf, but maybe it's a statement that uh, that the meaning is sound. So we're not grasping onto that statement, but if it's a sound, truthful meaning, it's in agreement with the Quran. Anything in agreement with the Quran, we accept. Anything in agreement with the authentic Sunnah, we accept. The third point is looking at the context of the Athar. So this is one of the things that is being pointed out finally uh, in our context in the Western academic realm, if you will, uh, and even some of the scholars, because they have realized what has happened in the West with many people running with Athar of the Salaf and then going to make a tatbiq or to implement what they read on particular individuals. Uh, so this has been uh, something which has had disastrous results. And even, I have to give credit where credit is due, Dr. Qadi, he pointed this out in his 
uh, in one of his uh, refutations, if you will. And so that was something he was correct in that issue, in that it has been misused, that many athar of the Salaf, people have taken some athar, leaving off other athar, okay? Taken maybe one narration and leaving a whole plethora of other narrations which show maybe an opposite meaning or give context to that one ather. So it's very important contextualizing the text and understanding when you are pl applying these things, like the issue of takfir. Similarly to takfir, and this is why Imam Fozan and also Imam uh, Abdulaziz Araji and so many ulama before them, but I just mentioned this in the contemporary context for those who need that for their hearts, is that these scholars from Ahl Sunnah, these major scholars in this time, have mentioned this, the uh, importance of uh, of realizing that these are ahkam shari, these are sharia-based rulings. So, for example, what has happened in the past is many people, they're reading uh, Shara Sunnah Imam Babahari. Some of them have never even studied the book. And they surely haven't even studied it in Arabic. And that's another problem. So here, you're reading a translation. And then you're making a uh, hukum on someone. At least read the Arabic if you know Arabic. And then beyond reading the Arabic, you need to study at the feet of the ulama with these things. You know, go to the shurahat of Ahl al-Ilm. And I don't say just the shurahat of Ahl al-Ilm. Meaning, go to the, the scholars themselves. So there's a there's a, a dual thing, and I've told I've talked about this prior to this because there are some people who haven't studied anywhere, and they're making fatawa and destroying communities and destroying the lives of people with athar of the salaf. So it's it's a very it's a travesty. So uh, the third point I mentioned a is context, contextualizing the athar. It needs to be put in context. So for example, if you say Imam Barbahari said this, okay. You know, or some of the great a'imma, they said this, or whatever the case may be. And then you then go to say, well, so-and-so did this. Halas, he's a mubtadiyah. That's very dangerous, especially if you don't have the elm and the tools to be able to do that. Uh, and you haven't studied, and you don't know the context of the athar, and you don't know the other athar, and you don't know the masali and the mufasid, and you don't have much fiqh deen. So this is very important that there's a lot that goes into this, and and, and especially making tanzil al-hukma al especially when it comes to implementing or making a judgment about a specific individual. This is where the tekfiris go wrong, and this is where the tabdi'is, if you will, the people who are extreme in tabdi'i, meaning they tajawuz al-had. The had, the bounds are here, but they go beyond the bounds. They're way up here with something. So that means it's out of the, out of the, the fold of Islam, not as in kufr, but meaning that they are doing something they have no authority to do. They have made an aberration in the religion, meaning a bid'ah, because they are making tasri' fi hukm al fi hukm takfir or hukm tibdi', meaning that they are in a hurry and they rush to make takfir of people or they rush to make tibdi' of people. And this is some of the fitna that we face in this day and age. And we have the other extreme, don't forget. We do have the other extreme where some people will never make takfir. And they will never make tibdir. And what I mean by this, I don't mean everyone should be involved in this, but I, they just say, Khalas, he's, he's a, you know, I know he's a Rafa the Shi'i, and he says there's 12 Imams in the Mahdi's in my closet, and, you know, and they, and he, he curses the Sahaba day and night and says, Aisha is this, and, but, the, you know, you won't make tikfir. Oh, he's a Muslim, though, my dear respected brother. You know, or someone else has a bid'ah mukaffara, bid'ah which takes you out of the fold of Islam. So they, even with that, they won't make tikfir in them. And then there's likewise the same with tibdir, people who innovate in every bab of the religion practically, and some people are silent about that. So it's very important to have the proper, appropriate balance, the balance of ahl sunnati with jama'ah. The fourth uh, point I want to mention about this, not just this athar, but any athar, this is probably one of the most important uh, points. And forgive me, I just came off my head with these points. I just thought about it for five minutes and said, hmm, what are important things that we learned from the scholars that we could talk about this because there's other problems and other implications that stem from this question. So the fourth issue of Habit is conformity uh, with the Nasus. Meaning that, for example, we have to remember an Athar of the Salaf, 
If we say Imam Ahmed said uh, Talib al-Ilm is like jihad, or Imam so-and-so said this, Imam Babahari said this, Imam Muzni said this, Imam Shafi'i said this, Imam Ahmed said this, Imam Abu Hanifa said this, okay? Those are not nusus. That is not really considered nusus uh, as far as the masdar of the deen, meaning that those, the essential texts that we're ordered to follow that is considered revelation, which is considered dalil, as the scholars mention. And the scholars do have some nuances about the concept of, of evidence, what makes up evidence. But they're all in agree that evidence is formed from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That is dalil. Qal Allah, qal Rasul. So we don't say Imam Baba Hari said, that's dalil for this. That might be dalil that this was a position of the Salaf. That might be dalil used as an evidence, making an istidlal from that, and using that as an evidence to make a point that this is in muwafaqah, this has agreeance with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So that's very important. So we have to know that, as some of the scholars mentioned, that the book of, of Allah, the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the uh, ijma, the consensus of the ulama. And then some, uh, then the fourth uh, level would be uh, uh, qiyas, okay, making an analogy. And so it's very important to know that in and of themselves, the narrations of the Salaf are not dalil. They're not evidence. If I say, you know, uh, you know, Salat, uh, Salat is an obligation. And you say, Imam Ahmed said uh, this about the prayer. That's not, that's not considered dalil. Now, it may point to dalil, but it is not in it itself. It's not evidence. The evidence to know the wujub of Salat is going to come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Establish the prayer. And this is because why? Al-Amr yifid al wujub Because the asal of a command in the shar is that Al-Amr, the command, it shows that this is something which is an obligation. And likewise with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is right there. That's what we call dalil. So this is something I wanted to talk about because many of our youth don't understand this. They don't, especially if they haven't studied. If they studied, then they know. But if they haven't studied and they haven't talaki ilm ala ahlihi, then if they haven't taken knowledge from the scholars and stuff, if they just read some books, uh, depending on the books that they read, it's easy to come up with misunderstandings. Okay, it's mi easy easy to mis misconstrue something. So <clears throat> someone will look at... Uh, uh, may may not know this these that that's not evidence in and of itself. <clears throat> Before we get to specifically your question, the reason I say this, I'll call you. I'll, I'll <clears throat> mention a, a a sitting I had once with Abu Salah al Afghani, one of our mashayikh, uh, who was doing his PhD in Jama Islamia. Uh, he is a sheikh in Kuwait, uh, Muhammad uh, Hisham, Hafid Allah <clears> Taala. <throat> Powerhouse, by the way. And so Abu Salah, I asked him, I said, uh, I asked him because I was doing my master's at the time. And my master's was similar to his PhD was about the Khawarij and their effect on uh, and and the the scholars of, uh, you know, Muhammad and the Wahhab and his su successors, how they uh, refuted the Khawarij so that they also they should not be considered Tekfiri and so forth. So he his 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 PhD literally is called Bara'a, something like Bara'a Imit uh, Da'wa min uh, Al Khawarij or Tekfir or Mithlahada. Something like this. So this is the title of his his thesis, his his dissertation, his his PhD that the Mufti came and made Manakacha. So our topics were very similar, only I was doing mine in English. So I used to ask him for a lot of advice, especially about issue of takfir. We used to sit many times, alhamdulillah, I recorded many of those things. Hopefully those files are not damaged. But anyhow, I asked him, I said, uh, you know, about the the uh, a narration of the Salaf that I came across. Because I maybe it was in uh, 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 Usul Lil uh, Lil uh, or something like this. It was a an effort of the Salaf. And I put it in my research. I translated, worked hard to translate it, put it in there about the Khawarij. And it was about basically 
whoever the Huarej is, you know, like fighting the Huarej is like something with light and, you know, it's like all the lights and, you know, I can't remember exactly what the Athar was of the Salaf. And he told me and he broke that down for me. He said, you know, that is not evidence because not all the Athar, we don't, there's no Dalil from the book in the Sunnah for what this great Imam has said from the Salaf. This is from his own Perhaps his, I, I, I don't know, I don't like to use the term ijtihadat, but because there is no real ijtihad in Aqidah, but there's no dalil for what he said, his likeness. This could have been his own, if you will, mubalaga, his own kind of exaggeration to, to make a point of, in the meaning that fighting the Khawarij is something mashroor, that is something legislated in the deen. So the athar itself was not... Uh, you know, it's not supported by evidence, but because it mentioned a certain type of reward and you can only get. So you'll find that from uh, there are many athar of the Salaf like this, that they're they are, you know, maybe from the ijtihad or the understanding or the statement of an imam. Uh, talking about a certain reward that you'll get for something which may not have any dalil from the Quran and the Sunnah. OK, but, it, you know, he's not going to be lying on the text. But anyway, it might be an exaggeration, whatever the case may be. This is why it's important to know context, to know whether it's sound. And, uh, and as we mentioned, muafaka is in an agreement what is, was said with the Quran and the Sunnah. Because if it isn't, there's no evidence to show what this imam concluded is from the Quran and the Sunnah. Then we don't, you know, we don't accept that you, you know, you don't quote from that as far as using it as a an evidence, so to speak. But you could just use it, you know, as as saying, yeah, this is true. But you might use it as an evidence to show how the Salaf felt about the Khawarij or something similar to this. So with that being the case, getting into the issue, obviously, Kun Salafian ala Jad is a very uh, excellent text. Uh, alhamdulillah, it's been translated into English. And it is by our Sheikh, Abdus Salam al-Suhaymi, one of the Mashayikh in Medina. And a very nice book. And he talks about some of the jama'at, some of the groups in contemporary times of Khwana Muslimin and some of their other uh, manifestations in Jama'at Takfir wa Hijra. And actually, it's very similar to some parts of my master's thesis as well. And I benefited from that book as well. I did quote from it, actually. And so... I don't recall a statement in there. So one thing is very important to affirm where you heard the statement. So then looking back at the Athar, because perhaps you'll find, which is good, that now you find in many of the English texts that have been translated, there's explanations that's been translated and it's uh, not just translated, but it has a shar. It has an explanation Translate, uh, by, you know, uh, translated and then it has the explanation from uh, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi or Sheikh whoever. Sheikh Rabi, Sheikh uh, Ibrahim Raheli, Sheikh, you know, whoever. Uh, so th that's something else to keep in mind uh, when it comes to explain explaining this. Now, I've heard similar statements. I've read similar statements uh, that, for example, in uh, Shara Sunnah Imam Baba Hari, he mentioned something similar to this, that, you know, all the people of Bida, they began with a Bida and it ends with a sword. So again, this is, pro, you know, these are statements from their tatabur, from their following up these uh, issues that many of the sects, what we can deduce from this statement. And again, it takes going back to some of the explanations of the scholars, but uh, we have studied this, these texts and taught these texts. But in general, what I understand from this text from my study of the scholar, so it's not just my ra'i, is that that uh, as as is attributed to uh, Imam Baba Hari and others, that the uh, you know because the Khwarij, one of the biggest things they are known for was of course takfir of the of kabira of the people doing the major sins and also uh, the rebellion against Muslim authority and what you find is many of the groups that they begin with their various types of bid'ah, whatever it is, and we're talking about sects, not jama'at necessarily. 
Okay, and there's a difference. Some of the scholars don't distinguish that, and some of the scholars do. I prefer the statement of the scholars who distinguish between, for example, uh, a sect and a group. Ahwana Muslimin is a group. Jamaat uh, Tablik are groups. Ashidis, Ash, Ash, uh, Ashidi is a sect. Diobandi uh, is a place, but it, it comes from a place, but it's also a sect. Uh, Maturidia is a sect. Kulabia is a sect. Irja or Murgia, perhaps there's some contention there of it being a sect or it being a type of creed that several different sects possessed. Okay, so this is something different compared to a Jama'a, Khwana Muslimin, or um, or Jama'at Tablik, where they may have a, a certain type of creed in general they kind of adhere to. For example, predominantly, although uh, Jamaat, all those groups are all over the world. They're the most numerous in uh, probably Muslim groups. Jamaat Tablik, I believe, and then probably Ikhwan Muslimin after them. I'm not really sure the numbers. So they're all over the place. English, uh, in all kind of speaking language. They could be Chechnyan Ikhwanis, they could be Chechnyan part of Jamaat Tablik, and they could be both. So basically, they share a methodology of certain points they do. But for example, you have might have uh, some Jamaat Tablik, some Tablikis that are closer to grave worship, okay? That might be from ignorant Muslims that are ignorant in India, for example, or in, or in uh, some African nation or uh, wherever, or Indonesia or, or something. Whereas their counterparts in Yemen, or I would especially say Saudi, because what they were educated with, they were educated with Tawheed, and but they love Tablik. They love that methodology. So they might not share the same Aqidah necessarily, but they same share the same methodology. Likewise, Akhwan and Muslimin, they have some points in their methodology, which is not necessarily points of creed necessarily, but it's more so a movement uh, or a methodology. So, whereas Ashadis, they ha share a creed. Their creed, you know, uh, especially with regards to the divine sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they will uh, make ta'wil of uh, some of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, this shows us, a, hopefully, it'll give us a little bit of insight there. And I, I hope I answered the question about the, the athar. Uh, every sect springs from the Khawarij. One of the meanings, you know, basically that every sect, they start out with uh, whatever their deviance is and they end with believing in rebelling the leader. So again, this is this is an issue. You, 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 you don't necessarily find it from the book and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu This is more what some of the Salaf, they said. You know, it's an athar from them you could say perhaps maybe their ijtihadat or maybe their experience, what they saw with many of the sects in their time. So uh, so this is very important to keep in mind when we have these athar of the salaf. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Muhammad.